Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Today on Finding Me, I have a very special guest, and that is Professor Linda Elkoff from the City University of New York. Linda is a professor in philosophy and she's also a social activist. She has contributed much to de decolonial thought and to whiteness studies. And with that, I'd like to welcome Linda. I'd like to say thank you very much for being here and, of course, for sharing your knowledge with us at the UNISA Decolonial Summer School. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Linda. I, now, I want to get straight into this discussion because we have so much to talk about. But what I found very moving in your opening lecture was you're explaining the whole idea of how the entire system of the world and even the labor force is structured, you know, into, in, into this whole concept of whiteness, of coloniality, and how it reinforces itself. And you gave your own particular example of the time that you were a factory worker. And, and I want to know, because when you spoke about top stitching, I thought of the days when I was in school and we did top stitching, etc. And, and how the pressures of the laborer to, to produce so much just to make minimum wage, how did that impact on you? And then how did you move from stitching collars, the top stitching, <laughs> to meet minimum wage into this, alhamdulillah, this wonderful opportunity in which you can now disseminate knowledge and of course create much awareness and do social activism? Well, I'm one of the lucky ones, there's no doubt about it, because I, I um, you know, I, I dropped out of high school and I made my way to college in the 1970s at a time when there was a lot of government support. There was a brief period <laughs> of, of government support for college. And when I had my first son, um, there was public, there was government support for daycare. So we were able to put him into a really nice daycare facility for $3 a week, which, you know, now people have to pay $400, $500 a week. So I was very lucky. I've had every kind of job you can imagine. I also dropped out of college and I've, and I've you know, done a lot of work. Um, my family was not very well off. Uh, I didn't know my father until I was 18 when I met him for the first time. Um, Lots of obstacles. Yeah, yeah, but I uh, loved um, studying and so I, I was able through luck and supportive partner who worked, he, he um, worked in factories the whole time I, when I went back to school because we had two children by that point and somebody had to keep the heat running and pay the bills. But I'm, I'm just very lucky. I mean, the, the statistics on uh, Latinas, I'm from originally from Panama, uh, are that, you know, we, we don't graduate high school, we don't graduate college, we have very, very high dropout rates. So I guess I was just a statistic, <laughs> a statistical average. And, and then you said, there was another example that you, you mentioned in the class when you spoke about it. You said uh, the, you know, the reluctance to believe that uh, the colonial power, the imperial power is coming with something good. And then that you spoke about Panama in 1989 with the invasion yes. of Panama. And you spoke about how it affected the psyche and the mentality and I think the inner subjectivity of the people who lived that, that invasion. Um, and as you spoke, I, I couldn't help thinking of the people in the Middle East and, and, and what was happening in Iraq and what's happening in Syria. And, and you know, then there's still almost the shock among Westerners of like, why do they hate us? You know, why do they, uh, you know, hate us? Why do they want to kill us? Why do they want to react to us? So if you could just tell us yeah. a little bit of your own experience. Well, in 1989, the United States invaded Panama and they um, ostensibly to democratize to get rid of General Manuel Noriega, who was a, a terrible um, leader for, for Panama. There was an opposition movement within Panama for years. My father was part of the opposition. My brother was part of the opposition. They, they were trying through democratic measures to bring about more democracy within the country. 
But the United States decided unilaterally to take out Noriega as a military operation. And it did not lead to democracy. Um, surprise, surprise. It, uh, they inaugurated a new president within a U.S. military base. I mean, he had no credibility. And in fact, he was just as involved in narco trafficking as Noriega. But my personal experience of it was quite life changing. By 1989, I was a seasoned activist and I and political leftist, and I knew about imperialism. I knew the history of colonialism. Um, but you know, you, you, when it hits you directly, you 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 find new a new understanding. And Panama had a kind of you know a long-term relationship with the United States because the United States had funded the the creation of the Panama Canal and controlled a 10-mile swath of land through the center of the country that it had unilateral political and economic control over. Um, and I was naive. I think a lot of us were naive that the United States would not do it to one of their main allies. They would not do this kind of thing. But they did. And it took me 12 hours to get through to my family. I was in New York at the time. And when I finally did get through to my brother, he was crouched under the dining room table watching U.S. MiG fighters take out buildings in his neighborhood and he was just praying that they wouldn't hit his. Um, what the most galling thing about that particular operation was that um, what they were doing and what has since come out in the reports and investigations about why the United States really invaded Panama and this relates to the Middle East, they had a lot of new technology that had not been used under fire. So they were testing their weapons? Before the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. The first Gulf War happened less than two years later. And one, a very high-ranking U.S. military official was quoted as saying, you know, we needed our soldiers to be trained under fire. And what that brought home to me in a very visceral and emotional way was that the Panamanian people who died, 4,000 people died, 100,000 people were left homeless, had no value or, or meaning. Their lives didn't matter, right? The Panamanian lives didn't matter. So you were live targets, basically practice targets. Practice targets. I mean, they also wanted to take out Noriega because he was not loyal to the United States. He was trading guns from East Germany to the, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. He, was, um, he had relations with Cuba. He wasn't a loyal U.S. ally. And so they, they had some reasons. But part of the reasons that they had for that invasion was a buildup for the first Gulf War. So this is the way colonialism and imperialism works, right? There are are, there's a, a military operation that has to be trained and schooled. Um, so it, it, despite my political sophistication, I thought at the time, <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot from that experience that has certainly stayed with me as I've watched further U.S. atrocities in Iraq, Afghanistan, threats against Iran mm -hmm. and so forth. And if somebody looks at you, and, and uh, please excuse me this, but they would look at you and say, but you're a white person. And, and so I think most of the Panamanians also look exactly like you. And I, I mean, fair skinned, you know, and would easily pass what we in South Africa, or what most of the people in the world would look at as, as white. So why use a white life as live target practice? Uh, or is there something beyond this that if you're in Latin America, Latino or Chicano, you're not actually white? Well, it's a good question. I mean, actually, Panama is very multiracial and I'm very light. I am not um, the typical, uh, I mean, the, the, even within my own family, the skin color ranges, you know, pretty dramatically. And there's quite a lot of Afro-Panamanians or black Panamanians who came from the West Indies to work on the canal and have stayed and are a very large part of the community. There's plenty of indigenous peoples um, from the areas in Panama and Colombia that live in Panama today. So, the, so phenotypically, Panamanians look 
all different. There's, there's kind of a, a color hierarchy. So the lighter you are, the more likely you are to be able to run the government mm -hmm. and be in the university leadership and so forth. But Panamanians come in all colors. But I think, I think there is a cultural racism against Latin Americans by the United States that that extends beyond phenotype. Even though lighter skinned Latinos such as myself, and part of the reason I'm lighter skinned is because I'm half white. My mother's Irish American and my father is Panamanian. My father is mixed race Panamanian. But certainly the United States is more comfortable with lighter skinned Latinas who can pass as white, absolutely. But there's still a cultural racism against all of Latin America and Latinas as pre-modern, um, less advanced, less civilized, more Catholic, which is seen as, you know, as pre-modern in a various way. So there, there's certain essentialized generalizations that are made about Latin America. And when you did your studies, and I suppose, well, you started through this whole interrogation of ethnic studies, whiteness, etc. You carried this lived experience probably with you when you started now, and then that drove your, your activism. Did you find that it was necessary to interrogate this question of whiteness and to contribute to this discourse, especially from where you were um, essentially being in the global south, but now articulating from the global north? Yes, because I am half white and because I can pass in some places, not in all places. I have been privy to conversations <laughs> that are very uncomfortable sometimes, but I've seen you know, the, how the society works because white people will s sometimes say things in front of me that they would not say in front of you. And so you can really see um, the racism very strongly. And it was a difficult experience for my sister and I who came from Panama and uh, to Florida when we were young girls and, and were raised in Florida. So it, it gave us a certain um, point of view and and you know it showed what the white racism because we knew that you know they they didn't even know who they were talking to they were so <laughs> ignorant they had no clue yeah. but I think whiteness is really critical to bring out into the open because there's ways in which our universities our knowledge systems our aesthetics uh, rankings, our, um, our cultural values are presented as neutral and transcendental and in reality represent white Eurocentric experiences and points of views and histories. So whiteness studies I think is, is important to make that more visible so that it can come under critical analysis and critical scrutiny. So we're going to a break now, but when we come back, I just want, for the benefit of the audience, to explain exactly what do you mean when you speak about whiteness. And then secondly, I want to translate that in terms of social activism and the fight for uh, a space in the universities in order to have these different discourses and discussions, especially like what we saw at UNISA in terms of the fight to establish ethnic studies or departments of ethnic studies, etc. But we'll talk about this when we come back, so we'll see you after the break. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me Today in the ITV with Professor Linda Alkoff. And before we went on to the break, Linda was explaining about the necessity of interrogating the question of whiteness and whiteness studies. But Linda, before we went on, while we were in the break actually, you, you raised a very interesting point and that is about Arab people. So can you just tell me what is so fascinating about this? Because now I'm quite bowled over by what you've just said. Yes, it's true. I mean, part of studying whiteness is to study 
um, who gets included and who does not get included and how that has changed over the years of colonialism. Currently in the United States, for a very long time, Arabs, North Africans, Middle Eastern people are classified by the U.S. Census as white. So when you look at the statistics in the United States right now, it's 64 percent white. <laughs> that 64 percent is misleading because it includes Arabs and North Africans. Um, and it's odd because what does that mean? Arabs and North Africans today are under a serious amount of surveillance mm -hmm. and um, ostracism and racism and violence. The mosques in Brooklyn, New York, where I live, have been um, surveilled by the FBI and uh, the other institutions in the United States. So they're not treated as white or as trustworthy citizens of the United States. They're not given the benefit of the doubt. They don't have the full rights and advantages that we might associate with whiteness. But because they're classified as white, it's to the advantage, I think, to the state. Because then, um, in some cases, for example, you, if you get charged with a crime, and you have a right to a jury of your peers. Well, if you're classified as white, oh you can have an all-white jury and it's be a jury of your peers and there can be no appeal. This has also happened to Latinos at different points in U.S. history. Mexicans in Texas for a while were classified as white because there was a famous case where a guy was charged with murder and he was tried by an all-white jury and his lawyer appealed and the appeal judge says no you can't appeal because Mexicans were now classifying <laughs> as white. So it's very convenient. In so other it's words. a way of guaranteeing that you're incarceration almost, just by the way in which you're classified. It, yeah, so it can be disempowering actually yes. to be classified as white. It's not always empowering. So you have to sort of see what is really going on. And if you look at the profiling that's happening in the Islamophobia, it's almost laughable to believe that Arabs and, and, and North Africans are classified as, as white. Um, but let's go on. Uh, you, you, in terms of your, uh, when I read your CV and I see that you've joined the Social Institute of Ju uh, Social Justice Institute and you're, you're strongly, um, you're, you're a great activist and also when I spoke to you, you said that there's almost no center or no department in the U.S. which has taught or has bring in teaching ethnic studies, etc., that has come about without activism and without, uh, you know, uh, fighting for this particular space. But we spoke about something more interesting than that. Also, is the way in which the education system is structured, and and tying students in into financial loans and debts that prevent them from escaping this whole capitalist structure of the way in which knowledge should be, which in the way in which knowledge is used to motivate them in particular directions and to prevent them from taking other courses. Yes, and that's why we're so excited about the Fees Must Fall campaign here in South Africa. And people are watching it very closely because we have a similar campaign to uh, have amnesty on student debt in the United States. It's changed dramatically in, in my lifetime so that now students carry $100,000 of debt by the time they finish their undergraduate education, in some cases, or more. It's crazy because tuition has gone up so dramatically in the private schools and also in actually in many uh, public universities, tuition has gone up. And there are a lot of unscrupulous banks and loan agencies that are willing to provide students with loans at, and, and don't disclose the full interest rate. So students Whoa. find themselves strapped with a huge amount of debt. And there's a big campaign against it. But the campaign in the United States, and I think here too, is not just about uh, relieving students of, of a debt that they should never have to bear at 21 years of age just starting their their job career but it's it's um, concerned about the political effects of this debt on the citizenry and the democracy of our societies because if a 21 year old comes out with that kind of debt their job choices are constrained they can't they go to law school and they want to do public interest law they can't do public interest law because it's low paid they have to do corporate law if they want to do medicine they should go into plastic surgery mm -hmm. <laughs> not work at a public health facility in a poor community so um, it it affects people's political participation also because you are burdened with j just having to focus on making money and 
it affects what people choose to study when they're in universities because they know they're going to come out with this huge amount of debt. So universities become vocational schools for some kind of professionalized job rather than a school in which you know, they, they will enhance their capacity to be fully participatory political citizen. So it's reinforcing the structures of coloniality and colonialism, forcing people out of critical thought, out of philosophy, out of those kind of engagements with literature, etc., and to taking vocations like economics and, and engineering probably. And it's demobilizing so, yeah. the citizenry of the United yeah. States and it's very much um, since the 1960s. There's been some research to show some conservative think tanks that were very cognizant that this would be a great boon to keep the United States from ever again having the kind of student rebellion that it had in the 1960s that was, you know, really nationally significant, helped to end the war in Vietnam, etc. But it, it so it demobilizes the, the student population and the citizenry at large. And that's why we want sometimes to us like, I mean, you know, don't Americans think, you know, sometimes when you when you just watch what comes out from the and the kind of support that people like Donald Trump are getting recently, it's it's almost shocking. So I, I want to just move this discussion a little bit further now to your whole focus and your study on, on whiteness. So can you just tell us what is whiteness and why is it important? Well, whiteness is a racial formation. It's like other racial formations that you know, it, they're different in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So in different parts of the world, you might find your identity changing when you come to the United States vis-a-vis -vis being in some other part of the world. So it's, it's, it's a historical racial formation um, that amalgamated a lot of different European ethnicities into one group. In the United States, the amalgamation of whiteness produced a kind of political legitimacy for a white dominated government. So white people could see that the government was dominated at the local and state and national levels generation after generation by white male leaders. But that was okay because the majority was white, this amalgamation. So the fact that the, the leaders were rich, they were from only certain uh, white ethnicities, there was a big to do when Jack Kennedy got elected in 1960 because he was an Irish Catholic. How can that be? There was like all this <laughs> consternation in the, in the nation about that. So, you know, it, the, the, the amalgamation of whiteness provides cover for uh, a white oligarchy that actually doesn't even represent fairly all of white people in the United States in terms of their economic issues or other kinds of issues. So that's, it has this long history. It's definitely, you know, connected to worldwide colonialism that emerged out of Europe and um, attempted unsuccessfully, but almost successfully, to take over the entire world. And they needed um, it, it, colonialism did two things: it, it um, exported problematic white populations to the colonies, poor people, convicts, etc., and it it also needed. Um, a class of people that could be colonial administrators and compradors, a bu buffer zone between the, the colonial subjects and the, the empire. And so white people were put into this kind of comprador role. And so the, the um, identification of, of whites you know, was affected by this long historical experience of playing this role in European empire in which they the masses of them didn't live rich but they still got advantages by being the you know the administrators for the colonies and that relates to white privilege yes it does it's it's clearly it's why the state in the United States and Australia and other places gave whites economic advantages because they wanted to keep white support for the oligarchy so there was the GI Bill that ensured education for white men from the 1950s, no matter the cost. There was um, special loan set aside for home ownership so that whites could buy homes. And most of our wealth is in our homes. It's not in our wages. We can put, take a second mortgage out on our home to put our children through college. So, and uh, the segregation of real estate also advantaged whites because home values are determined by how many white people live in your neighborhood. It's not how strong your house is or how big your house is, it's all about how many white people live in your neighborhood. So the enforcing the segregation of real estate um, it kept up the value of white homes. 
And I think many people in South Africa will relate 100% <laughs> to what you've just said because we're living the same realities. But we, we've come to the end of the show and I'd just like you to give us a parting thought, especially in terms of the Fees Must Fall campaign. Well, it is critically important and it needs to get, uh, what, what is in, especially impressive to us from the United States is that it has united with Roads Must Fall, it has united with the campus workers who are subcontracted out and who are, um, uh, you know, their wages and, and benefits have been depressed through the subcontracting process. So there's, there's alliance between workers and students. And we don't very often see this. This was one of the important issues in the, in the 60s student movement. So that alliance between workers and students, I hope, will remain and remain strong. Inshallah, but thank you very much for sharing these ideas with us and I think the students will pick up on much of what you've said and hopefully the people in policy also will realize the impact of really decolonizing now. So with that, thank you very much for sharing your time and being here Linda and for giving us some of those wonderful lectures at the Inisa Decolonial School. Fiyamanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.